Good morning, church family and others that are joining with us. We welcome you to the online worship service of the Salvation Army Lindsay Community Church. We are so glad that you are joining with us and our hope is that you feel the presence of the Lord as we worship together, even though we cannot be together face to face. Remember those in prayer that are on a health prayer list, Shannon Switzer, uh, Major Linda Balmer, Ruth Bar Barber, uh, Jane Sheward, and always remember Morley Danes and Lucy Pelly are in long-term care homes, so keep them in your prayers as well. Bible studies continue this week online, Monday night for anyone and Thursday night for the ladies. Both are at 7 p.m. and the information for joining can be found in your bulletin. Please remember the food bank during these times. They are always in need of food and other household items. Partners in Mission provides the necessary funding to carry out the ministry of the Salvation Army worldwide. Our target here at our church is $9,000. The campaign goes until the end of May, so please prayerfully consider giving to Partners in Mission. There will be a short video after the call to worship. And the call to worship. This morning, two Bible verses. The first from Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And from 2 Corinthians 5 and 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Today we're at Nega Nega Community School, one of five locations for the Water Sanitation Hygiene Project, often called a WASH project. This project has three main objectives. One, to provide safe, clean water to the community. Two, to provide sanitation and hygiene practices. And three, to help with food security. We're excited today because we're going to be hearing from the beneficiaries and the impact that the WASH project is having in this community. For me, the Salvation Army has helped us a lot to improve with water sanitation in school. By introducing the tanks and just building us the abrasion block, which is too useful to us. Clean water can help us to prevent us from being infected with diseases like cholera. The school must be clean yes, to avoid those diseases. My name is Kenneth Katongo. For us not having clean water, it affects our education because we can't manage to learn our agriculture project. The Salvation Army has helped us by providing a water tank. I'm the acting deputy head for Nansenga Primary and Secondary School, Primary Section. This school has about uh, 1,014 pupils, 445 boys, and uh, we have uh, 669 girls. Since the Salvation Army came in, we have clean and safe water to drink for the pupils and the teachers. It is very easy for us to have any activities in the school without fail because we have water around. Like mopping the classrooms, watering the plants, even in the school garden. It was difficult for us because we didn't have water in place. My name is Chipo Mompo. I'm a physics teacher here at Nansenga Secondary School. A long time ago, we used to drink salt water, which was unsafe for us and the pupils. The teachers are no longer getting sick, neither are the pupils getting sick. The coming of the clean water has made the school to make a garden. When the crops are ready or ripe, we 
sell them to the locals and we use the money to buy the chalks, the textbooks and the pens for teachers and pupils. The Salvation Army is our school redeemer. It is the, the Nasenga Redeemer because it brought us clean and safe water that we never had for so many years here.
good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Oh, I've seen Many searching for answers but I know we are searching for answers Only you provide Cause you know just what we need before we say a word You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are Well, good morning, church family. Here we are, another week, another shutdown week, but another week that God has been good and that we have had opportunities to love him, show the community that we love them in Jesus' name, show our family members. How have you done with that this week? Some of us have done pretty good and others not so much. But you know what? We are on the dawn of a new week and it's a new day. So with that, if you would permit me in my rain-soaked hair, this is Friday that I'm recording this and I've been on a retreat day and I was getting all uptight because I thought, oh my goodness, I have to go back and I have to offer our pastoral prayer and what am I going to do? Like I've got to get back to the house. And then I thought, no, I think that you'll forgive me this morning for being in my warm clothes, sitting in my car. I went out and uh, was taking a walk and it started to rain and I thought, oh, I better get back in the car. So if you just permit me today to be in my civvies and offer up a prayer to our Father for you, um, no matter what we wear, where we are, He is sovereign, He is Lord. And uh, just if you would bow with me now. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your creation. Thank you for the rain. Thank you that we are able to experience your goodness through nature. And thank you that today we have breath and we have life and we have opportunity to be your hands and feet in our communities. 
God, there are so many in our congregation right now that need physical healing, and we pray for them, and that your will be done right here on earth, Father. Give us the patience and endurance and fortitude to accept your will and to praise you, even when we don't necessarily um, appreciate or want um, to live out that will in the way you know, in the way that it's being delivered. But God, you are truth and you are light. And we thank you that you have sent people in our lives to point the way to you. We thank you for your holy scripture. Your word tells us that all we need to do is seek and we will find. We need and we we need you today, Father. I pray for those in our congregation who are suffering financially and are suffering with their families, Father. You are a God of restoration, and you are a God that wants to love so much on our chil- on his children that, that we have everything we need. And really, when you think about it, and in reality, we do have what we need if we have you. And we thank you for that. Father, bless our people. Bless us as we continue to seek your face. Bless us as we continue to be your hands and feet in our communities and with our families. Bless us, Father, as we are striving to be your servants here. I pray that as we go into a new week, that your love and grace is found and experienced. And for those in our congregation who really don't know how awesome and how special you are. Father, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you draw them and that they are able to acknowledge that you are a good God. And indeed, you are their God this morning. Father, bless us. Bless our efforts. Keep us safe in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 12 to 19. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? 
Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Good morning. Uh, we have another Sunday and another lockdown and more news on the horizon. And I'm hoping that you still feel encouraged, not necessarily by what's going on around you, um, but encouraged that the truth of the gospel doesn't change, that our Savior is with us, his spirit lives in us, and that we still have a hope that is eternal. And in difficult times, um, how beautiful it is that we can hold on to those truths. Well, today we're looking at Acts 3, verses 12 to 19. And thank you, Jacob, for reading that for us. Um, and I want us to think about who do you represent? Who do I represent? Who do you represent? Who do we as the church corporately represent? Now, last week, we imagined being in a marriage or a friendship where we did all the right things but didn't know or love our partner or friend, where why we did those things was to check off a list of good do's and don'ts, um, where things weren't motivated by love or by, or by desiring the best for the other person, in contrast to how and what God intended for his church to be, that he intended it to be in unity of the spirit, where we are to be stewards of what he has given us for his kingdom's purposes. Now, this week, we're continuing in the book of Acts, and we're working through it non-chronologically, so this isn't in any specific order, but we're looking at different things within Acts, and it's leading up to in May when we'll end up celebrating together uh, the events of the day of Pentecost and what that means for us today, where God poured out his spirit on the believers, on his church. In chapter 3, today, we see a crippled man healed. And we see Peter giving a talk on Jesus being the healer, not on him being the healer, not on or not on John being the healer either. Peter, he's teaching in the temple colonnade or the corridor um, with large structural pillars supporting the roof all around them. This is probably where Jesus had taught uh, before as well when he was still alive on earth. It was one of the places where the church worshipped together. Now we're entering this little happening that we read about together and we see people amazed that a crippled man has been completely healed. They were amazed and they were trying to put all the pieces together and what they did was to start praising or thinking that the disciple instead of the Lord who the disciple asked to heal the man was the one that had the power. So imagine what it's like to be in the place where you have a great sphere of influence. Every work week, you may have great responsibilities and a group of people around you that listen to your every instruction. Or maybe it's within your family, where those you love place their trust in you, in your authority, in your experience and wisdom. These are privileged places to, to lead in or, or to be present in. I used to have a teacher in high school who was very charismatic. Everyone loved him. He did the best extracurricular events, and we had the best get-togethers uh, when, he, when he was in charge of them and he organized them. And he was fun to be around. The staff at the school liked him, and he seemed to be the school's, I'll say it, the golden child of the school. His ideas were always the best, and the first ones to be agreed to and followed. 
and he was friendly, and he was a hard worker. He helped his students, and most worked hard for him and did well. Now, looking back many years ago, I can see that this teacher used his talents, and maybe you could say his giftings and his personality to do something that often doesn't happen. He taught the curriculum he was supposed to, and his students became as enthused about the curriculum as he was. They didn't idolize him. They enjoyed learning from him. And he created an atmosphere where he made sure all of the class had a voice and all were valued. Now, those are pretty high standards and a great teacher. I have good memories of that class. We hear this, and the first thing we might think is, where, where is this story going? Well, or good. That's what he was supposed to do, wasn't it? And I'm going to say to you, yes, my sermon is over. Just kidding. I tell the story to make us think about not only being aware of the motivations of others, but to also think about our own motivations. And to think about whether our motivations sometimes become about us, about our being praised, instead of our motivations being about God being praised. Now there's a disclaimer here. This isn't heading towards false humility, where you look down and you shuffle your feet, hoping not to draw any attention to yourself after you did a great job at something. It's okay to take a compliment for something. It's okay to recognize God has wonderfully made you and to have joy in his craftsmanship of you and of others. You're called to encourage each other, to hold each other up and to, cel and to celebrate together that Christ Jesus spirit indwells every believer, every follower of Jesus Christ. But today it's about remembering who you represent in the midst of all that's going on around you. And there's so much going on in today's scripture. There's always, there always is below the surface when people are involved. But let's look at things together. Asking God to keep speaking into our hearts as individuals and into our church family as a whole, corporately. Keep in mind our question, who do you represent. Now, the people started to look at the messengers, not the one who sent the messenger. Peter and John were given the ability to heal people as God, through his spirit, directed them. The church was new, it was growing, and God's wisdom directed his children for kingdom purposes kingdom moments where things are accomplished were accomplished for his plans. I won't go into Abraham and Jacob and Moses and the prophets and talk a lot about covenants and God's plan through Israel <laughs> leading to the Messiah for his plan of redemption for mankind. Okay, I did just say that all, so I did say it. Um, but back to Peter. Wearsby makes a note that nobody would dare deny the miracle because the beggar stood there before them, all in perfect soundness. To accept the miracle would have been to admit that Jesus Christ is indeed the living Son of God and that his name has power. But what happens at this time? Peter has to bring their attention off of himself and back onto Jesus, or maybe onto Jesus for the first time. He brings it all back into focus. In verses 12, 13, which were read earlier, it says, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. Then he uses the moment to help them remember to challenge their view on things with their history. He makes it personal. Verse 13 says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you 
and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. It became personal real quick. For the disciples, it was always about Jesus. Every event was opportunity to bring it all back to God's plan through the Messiah. They had a mission given to them, and they were going to do their best in his strength to accomplish that mission. Every time people started to look at them, in Scripture we see that they refocused the people on Jesus. They took what the people believed and focused from there to what was true, past, present, and future. Verse 16 tells us, And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. In this example that we read, Peter was gracious, maybe thinking of the words of his Lord on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Verse 17 goes on, And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, turn away from, recognize, acknowledge, and turn away from those things that are sinful, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. There's something very important to recognize here. And to remember, they were speaking to Jews who would have had some familiarity with the Hebrew scriptures. If you look around you, scripture has become lost to most of society. Don't go into the midst of those who don't know about Jesus, condemning them as if they did know and understand and have refused it. Go in with love, kindness, gentleness, promoting to the best of your ability, caring relationships, and speak what you believe in the hopes they will be moved by God's Spirit to believe too. Not everyone believed the apostles, the disciples' message, and it didn't stop persecution. As we read scripture, we know persecution happened. As we look at history over the centuries, we know persecution has happened. But the church grew regardless. And the church is growing regardless. God is involved. God's plan of redemption was still leading to Christ's return. And it's still leading to Christ's return. Verses 20 and 21 say, So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. That's our hope. That's a future message, but it's very important to keep in mind, Peter was talking to Jewish people, most of who were familiar with all that had been going on. The people started to look at Peter as healer, and Peter redirected them back to Jesus, but not just to Jesus, the guy who can heal sick people. He used the situation to refocus them on Jesus, the Messiah, the promised one, the one who heals us from our sins, not just from ailments. As the prophet Isaiah foretold of the Messiah in Isaiah 53 and 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises We are healed. This brings more clarity to Acts chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets and through what we just read in Isaiah, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, turn away from those things and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Jesus died to give us life through him, forgiveness of sins, redemption from the illness of sin, the fallenness of the sinful nature through Adam and Eve and the fall in the Garden of Eden. Wearsby says, Peter had explained that the cross was the meeting place of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. They spoke the words of Jesus because he has authority, not them. 
That goes for us today, too. Wearsby goes on, balanced evangelism, balanced sharing of our faith in Jesus Christ. Representing Christ presents to the sinner both repentance and faith. The gospel was presented to the Jews. If they as a nation repented, Christ would return, but they didn't. And the message went to the Samaritans and then on to the Gentiles. The mystery of God's plan of salvation moved forward. And here we are today. And the message is still true and it's still living and it still gives hope to the world. So, do we sometimes put others or maybe even ourselves before Christ? Let's get it out in the open. I do. So what do we do with that? How do I represent a holy Savior, a holy sinless God, when I still struggle with sin? How do we represent a sinless, holy God, even though we may still struggle with sin? God's word tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. One of the biggest influences in my spiritual life was a man who wasn't perfect in all he did. He had failures in behavior. He had failures in motivation, in reactions to events. But this guy rarely or never, ever pointed me to himself. Though he was a good example, I could look to the examples as positive and helpful. He always pointed me to God. One thing he had together was humility. And this was from a thankful heart for God's gracious gift of salvation from the sinful nature that he knew he once had. We all have some failures, but it's God's spirit in us that transforms us into the image of Jesus Christ. We all come from different places backgrounds, upbringings, challenges. God knows that. God works with us, knowing us as individuals. That's something that I think the Christianity, the Christianity, it's something that Christianity is unique with, and that is God enters into our world and desires relationship with us. God works with us, knowing us as individuals. But the result is the same, and it leads to the same hope of our eternal life with him. By God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, we become in right relationship with God. When your eyes are opened to the love of God, you recognize quickly that there are things in your life that aren't like him, things that don't represent him well. So how do we represent a holy Savior, a holy God, knowing that we are fallen, that we're broken people, that we struggle. Maybe it's by recognizing our weakness in the light of his holiness. And with thankful hearts, humble hearts, submitting ourselves to him and trusting he is working in us. That's what people need to see in us. They need to see God's wholeness lovingly and relationally working in and through our brokenness. Then his wholeness becomes our blessing and may become their blessing as well as they turn their lives to him, those who don't know him. Peter represented Jesus Christ by using the situation to refocus the people on Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, our Redeemer, Lord, and Friend. So let's use our lives to point others towards him. Let's encourage each other in our church family, in our community of believers within Lindsay and the surrounding area. There are lots of brothers and sisters in Christ that are involved in other churches in this area too. Let's encourage each other to recognize God's goodness in our midst. 
How do we represent him? We represent him by being honest about ourselves, by doing our best in his strength to live for him, and by pointing others towards him, using our successes and our failures as example of his grace, of his mercy, of his love, and of his plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. The truth doesn't change just because somebody doesn't believe it. And we've been given the truth in Scripture. Hold on to it. Hold on to him. Because he's certainly holding on to you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have examples in your word of real people who you worked through out of your love and who you encouraged through their weakness to be strong in you, to serve you by sharing your truth and by pointing others towards you. Examples of people, Lord, who submitted their will to your will the best they could, as we read in James last week a little bit, you know, works are important, Faith is important, but the importance is the tying together so that the works are done because of the faith that we have and the trust that we have in you from thankful hearts. Help us to represent you well, Lord. We love you and we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you.
for joining us today. Um, I hope that as you go through your week that you remember that there's a freedom in the grace of God as we strive to honor him in what we do, as we strive to represent him. And I want you to remember the words of Isaiah 46 and verse 9 within your week. Take it with you. And they say, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. That is the God we serve, the creator of the universe who has made a plan, and we have the privilege of being in relationship with him. This is a journey. As you represent him, know that he is working in you. And enjoy that you don't and never have to walk this life alone. The creator of the universe goes with you. Bless you. Enjoy your week. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you Whoa, My lighthouse, my lighthouse I will trust the promise You will carry me safe to shore Sure.